a young woman murdered on a well-traveled public street. Police left with only very few clues. Soon, even these dry up, and the case goes cold. To this day, the killer remains unidentified, and the community still seeks answers to this baffling and brutal mystery. Maybe you can help. I'm Sheriff John Bunnell, and this is Cold Case Unsolved. The most important person in the case you're about to watch could be you, the viewer. If you see anything that triggers a memory or a suspicion, we need to know about it, and so do the local authorities. Later, we'll tell you how you can contact us. Until then, watch closely as we present the facts as they currently stand in this cold case unsolved. September 17, 1988, the city of Gresham, Oregon, a sleepy suburb of Portland. 25-year-old Ann Hansen, who lives with her parents, looks forward to a pleasant weekend. A recent college graduate and athlete, she works at a ski shop in Portland. She had got into skiing a little bit late, but she developed a good talent for it. She loved all the things in and around the industry. It was a kind of lifestyle that allowed her to be outdoors, to be with real wholesome people. For as long as I can remember, she was always a soccer goalie, uh, did basketball, did softball. There wasn't a person that she ran into that didn't like her instantly. The jocks liked her, the ones that are in the National Honor Society liked her, and those who weren't, just everybody seemed to really love Ann. My sister was very outgoing. She had a really good sense of humor. And she was one of those gals that appealed to a lot of different people. I mean, she was the one that listened, the one that you know helped keep a friend on track. She was always sort of the motivator, the instigator, the one that Jenna was making you know, others you know, feel better. On this particular weekend, Ann's schedule took her west into Portland to her job at the ski shop. She left her pickup here in the public parking lot of Max, Metropolitan Portland's light rail system. Next, she boarded the train for the 40-minute ride into Portland, where she spent the day at work. Then, as evening approached, she and a female co-worker decided to tour the Oktoberfest celebration at Lloyd Center a large shopping mall just a few blocks away. Around 7.30 p.m., Ann and her friend left Lloyd Center in her friend's car and drove to another Oktoberfest event in the community of Mount Angel. Here, Ann made a seemingly insignificant decision that would eventually seal her fate. She decided to leave her backpack and coat with her car keys in the trunk of her friend's car while they attended the celebration. Friends and family said this wasn't unusual for Ann, who frequently wore sweatpants with no pockets and was always misplacing her car keys. But on this particular occasion, it set in motion a tragic train of events that would culminate in a brutal and senseless murder. As Ann Hansen and her friend walked through the Oktoberfest in Mount Angel, she had no way of knowing of the terrible danger that lurked a few hours ahead in the darkness. It was after midnight when the pair returned to Portland and stopped at a McDonald's drive through where the friend offered Ann a ride home. She declined, saying she would take the Max train instead. This would take her to the Gresham City Hall parking lot where her car was parked. From there, it would be just a short drive home. Ann's friend drove her to the nearby Lloyd Center Station, where witnesses and the train operator confirmed that around one o'clock, she boarded the eastbound train for Gresham. Normally, the last train would have departed earlier, and Ann might have avoided the impending tragedy. But in a cruel twist of fate, it turned out that one violent crime would lead to another. The train was delayed due to an assault incident at an earlier stop and arrived late enough to pick up Ann and take her to Gresham. We had conversation about it. I was like, no, I'm gonna take you. We just, let me just drive you to your vehicle at the end of the, no, 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 it's too far. You know, I should've just drove her home. No one can know for sure what was going through Ann's head on the 40 minute ride as the train rolled through the night. 
a good guess is that she was pondering her prospects of getting a full-time job in the exciting world of competitive skiing. She was going to be applying for, and actually had been asked to apply for, the management position on the U.S. freestyle team, arranging the travel, arranging you know, whatever it is the team needed from a, a, an operational standpoint. The one thing we do know is that at some point in the trip, Anne realized that her car keys were back in her friend's trunk and that she would be locked out of her vehicle when she arrived in Gresham. Anne was last seen on the train by a passenger who departed at the 162nd Street station. She realized somewhere on that MAX train that she didn't have her keys and probably either made the decision on the MAX train or when she got to the, the parking lot where her vehicle was, that she would just walk home. To do this, she most likely rode past the city hall stop where her car was parked and continued on to the next stop, which was better located for the walk to her house, approximately a mile and a half to the south. For someone as young and athletic as Anne, it would be an easy stroll on a quiet night, or so it seemed. Well, Gresham had grown from a small town uh, that grew strawberries to annexing into Mid-County and south of the main part of Gresham and up towards Troutdale and Fairview. And then they started building subdivisions. With more people came a lot more problems. I don't think making a decision to walk in 1988 would be an odd decision at all. Anne left the train at approximately 1.40 a.m. The last witness to possibly see her alive reported a woman who fit her description walking near a major arterial about a third of a mile from the train station. Anne's destination was a pleasant neighborhood in an older residential section of Gresham. The most direct route was down Roberts, a major road on the edge of a well-populated neighborhood. Even at this hour, Roberts carried a fair amount of traffic, and few would have guessed it was about to become the scene of an extraordinarily violent assault. As Anne approached the intersection of 9th and Roberts, yet another cruel twist of fate occurred. Patrolman Claudio Grandjean of the Gresham Police. On the day Anne Hansen was murdered, I had been trying to serve an arrest warrant on a known crook. Well, I'd driven by his house a couple times and I'd driven by some of the spots that I knew he liked to hang out at. And I had just cleared a call on the other side of town, went just a few blocks up the road and stopped to run radar I zapped one car and I got the call and I came right out here on the Hogan straight to 9th, which is, as it turns out, was only 60 seconds away. But for Ann Hansen, those crucial 60 seconds would become nothing less than eternity. September 18, 1988, a chill, damp fall night in this quiet Gresham neighborhood. At 1.50 a.m., several residents in the vicinity of 9th and Robert Streets are awakened by the sounds of a woman screaming and pleading for her life. Calls begin to stream into 911. Caller report hearing a female screaming in the area of 9th and Robert, no additional. Patrolman Grand John is only 60 seconds away. He responds. I don't think one of the things I considered was that it's somebody who's been murdered. You know, I was thinking maybe domestic violence, maybe a drunk person being kind of rowdy or fighting, whatever. I got there within a minute of the time I was dispatched. I came down 9th Street and I saw a vehicle and two guys leaning against the front of the vehicle and I could see a body in the street. So now I'm thinking, did somebody get hit by, by a car? Both guys flagged me down actually before I stopped. I said to him, did you hit her? Did you Thinking hit her? that they'd no. hit somebody in the street and, and they were very frantic. They were uh, almost hysterical. And as I was walking up, before even getting to her close enough to make out any detail, I could see a large pool of blood around her head. So I knew that there was a, a serious injury. And then I walked all the way up and then I, it was quite obvious that she was deceased. It was uh, what we call overkill beyond what was necessary to just kill a person. There was a lot of stabbing and slashing. It was a very violent scene. I've been a police officer for 18 years, and uh, this is 
um, along with one or two other cases that I could think of the most violent scene I've ever been to. Well, Ann Hansen had uh, at least 11 separate cutting and stabbing wounds. She had two wounds to her neck, which are slashing wounds, severing a large vein in the neck. She had uh, nine wounds to her torso, most in the front, uh, one in the back, one of which uh, penetrated the right ventricle of the heart, so she died from uh, stab wounds to the neck and to the heart. Carla Peluso, now Gresham's chief of police, was a detective at the time of Ann Hansen's murder. She got the late night call at her home and was on the scene in less than an hour. Most crime scenes I have been at in the course of my career would be inside a home and you could relate another person to it or there was, there was some indication of a reason and there was just no reason why this should have happened other than it was, you know, the hours of darkness. Violent crime is the final chapter in a longer story with a wealth of detail that points to the assailant. Law enforcement inherits a puzzle with many pieces, and their primary task is to assemble those pieces into a coherent picture, which can solve the crime. But every now and then, the police encounter a case that defies logic and seems to go to the darker recesses of the human heart. Sadly, the murder of Ann Hansen definitely fits that mold. You know, there was nothing leading you in one particular direction of, you know, of domestic violence or uh, a drug deal gone bad or some of those things where you can put some sense of logic. And that's, uh, again, I think the part that has always made this a very challenging and haunting case. Well, she got off the library. Where would she come from? In the immediate aftermath of the murder, Gresham police have virtually no physical evidence. The crime scene itself reveals very little. No blood is found except in the immediate vicinity of the body. A search of the nearby area turns up Ann's address book in a shallow ravine next to the road about 25 feet from the body. When fingerprinted, it reveals no prints other than Hansen's. While the coroner's report supplied useful information about the physical nature of the crime, it provided no significant clues to move the case forward. The weapon was a single-edged, blade knife, meaning it had one sharp cutting surface, one blunted surface. It was approximately an inch and a half in thickness, the blade, at least four to five inches long. She had uh, wounds of her left hand, typical of grabbing the blade. So she was uh, alert and attempting to defend herself. The wounds to the neck were inflicted from behind with somebody securing her head uh, with the right hand because the wounds are directed from the left side of her neck to the right side of her neck and there were at least two, probably more. There is no evidence of sexual assault or robbery. The location of the crime posed other obstacles. The stretch of Roberts where Hansen was murdered runs next to the Springwater Trail, a naturally preserved area that runs for miles in either direction. The assailant could have easily disappeared into this area and avoided detection by witnesses or the police. With very little physical evidence to aid them, detectives pursue other avenues of investigation. Searching for a motive, they run an exhaustive check of Anne's friends and acquaintances, looking for anyone who might hold a grudge against her. They come up empty. It begins to appear that Hansen's murder was a random encounter of the worst kind imaginable. It was a very violent crime. Whoever did this had to be very angry over something and that we have nothing to tie that anger to Ann Hansen. So whatever brought them to that location in an agitated state to commit such a violent crime is a mystery. At the same time, detectives scour the neighborhood, looking for witnesses and additional leads. Some of those who called in mentioned the sound of a departing vehicle in about the same time frame as the screaming, but there are no eyewitnesses. And since Roberts is a busy street, it becomes difficult to tell what, if any, traffic was associated with the murder. But then, one of the neighbors offers a very interesting observation. She was awakened by Hanson's screams, but then laid back down in the darkness. Shortly afterwards, she heard the noise of hard-soled boots running away from the crime scene. When she looked out her bedroom window, she saw an adult person passing by dressed in dark pants and what looked like a letterman's jacket. For an instant, she thought she saw something shiny in the person's hand. At this point, 
Detectives had almost all the hard information they were going to get on this case. Almost, but not all. Stay with us for one more critical development, plus an expert profile of the killer. One major challenge in the Ann Hansen case was to reconstruct the specifics of the crime, even though the scene yielded very little evidence. The only two facts known with certainty were the duration of her train ride to Gresham and the location of her body on Robert Street. It seems highly unlikely that Ann was stalked by someone she met at one of the Oktoberfest celebrations. The length of the car trip back to Lloyd Center and the random decision to take the train would have made it nearly impossible to intentionally trail her back to Gresham. Another possible but highly unlikely scenario is that Anne accepted a ride with someone after she was last seen walking toward her home. By all accounts, Anne did not lead a high-risk lifestyle, and the screams heard by residents strongly suggest that the crime did not take place within the confines of a car. If somebody pulled up in a car, you know, and said, hey, do you want a ride? I'm not sure she would get in, but being the trusting person she was, you know, maybe she would, or maybe it was an acquaintance, or maybe it's somebody that she'd seen before. The timing of the train ride and the calls to 911 strongly suggest that Anne was murdered at or very close to where her body was found. Her train stopped in Gresham at 1.43 a.m., and the first report from residents occurred at 1.55 a.m., an interval of 12 minutes just the amount of time it would take to get from the train station to 9th and Roberts on foot. This scenario still leaves two possibilities. One is that somebody in a vehicle stopped her on Roberts, attacked her, and then departed before any other traffic witnessed the incident. The other is that someone on foot caught her and killed her, then melted away into the night, either into the residential area east of Roberts or down into the deserted darkness of the Springwater Trail. But without hard information, it became impossible for investigators to do more than speculate. Come over here for a the critical 48 hours when the vast majority of homicides are solved had come and gone. Ten days after the killing, posters went up all over Gresham, asking anyone with useful information to come forward. While a number of tips did flow in, they failed to produce a substantial break in the case. My main feeling is that if this person or persons can be apprehended. Um, it won't bring back my sister, but it may save some other family or persons the same kind of grief and loss that we've had to go through. As the weeks turned into months, no new leads of any significance materialized. The trail toward the killer, never warm from the outset, grew increasingly cold. Fall turned into winter. After checking out over 136 tips and conducting nearly 200 interviews, the case had slowed almost to a standstill. Spring arrived, and a memorial march for Anne was organized. It followed the same route she had taken on that fateful night. Still, no new developments in the investigation. There is no real closure when somebody dies, because it just means that you've stopped thinking about them, and you can't do that. Then, in November of 1989, 14 months after Anne's death, one last lead presented itself. It turned out that there were two men in nearby Tom Park around the time of the murder. The park is located on 9th Street, about three blocks from the spot where Hanson was murdered. The two men who were friends told police that they saw a third man walk through the park a few minutes after they heard screaming in the distance. They described him as in his mid-20s, with dark shoulder-length hair, and dressed in blue jeans, a field jacket, and boots. Was this new sighting connected to the person whom an earlier witness saw running up 9th Street at the time of the murder? Or was it just another shadowy coincidence in the early morning hours of that damp fall night? With no additional information, it was impossible to tell. And despite media attention to this new development, this person of interest was never located. Investigators remained haunted by the extraordinary violence of this apparent random killing and the kind of personality that might be involved. 
They sent the details of the case to the FBI's Criminal Profiling Unit in Quantico, Virginia. What they got back paints a disturbing picture of a highly pathological personality. The offender is probably a white male in his 20s. He is most likely single or divorced, and his impulse to murder may have been triggered by a conflict with a woman shortly before the killing. His work or school record would likely reveal conflicts with both peers and superiors. He would be edgy, impulsive, and generally unpleasant. He would also be known to own a large knife and to sometimes display it to people. Finally, he may live only a short distance from the murder and may have been walking home when it happened. She was a very outgoing person. She grew up in an old neighborhood of Gresham where people probably still left their back doors open. I wouldn't hesitate to think for a minute that she thought twice about walking home. She'd done it before and she probably would have kept on doing it if this had not happened to her. For years I've gone through this. I should have just drove her home. I should have just drove her home. You know, in life you have the givers and you have the takers. Um, and my sister was an incredible giver, an incredible giver. To this date, the murder of Ann Hansen is like a puzzle with no obvious solution. Any information you or anyone else can provide police might help them solve this case gone cold. If you have information, please call the toll-free number listed below and we'll connect you with the proper authorities. Anything you have to share might trigger a solution to this baffling mystery. In the meantime, I'm Sheriff John Bunnell, and this is Cold Case Unsolved. Cold Case Unsolved is offering a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the perpetrator in the case you have just seen. An additional reward of $11,000 is being held in trust through the family of Ann Hansen. Your help can make a difference. If you know anything that might solve this crime, please call.